All right. I'd like to call this meeting of the Warren Astronomical Society to order. Thank you very much for joining us live on a Thursday night. Uh, we've got a good crowd here on the WebEx, and I understand we also have people tuning in on YouTube, which is fabulous. Um, there is a slight time delay with YouTube, but if you type questions in, into the chat there, we will have somebody relay them to the people on WebEx so that they can be answered. So thank you very much again. Um, as your president, I would like to thank you for bearing with us as we go into a season of wonderful weather, delightful things to observe, including a comet, and no ability to share it safely with the general public, which is a real bummer. But we are hanging on, and uh, <clears throat> we are planning, as I said at the Cran virtual Cranbrook meeting, to have the picnic. The picnic will be in August this time. And it will, um, we are going to have the club provide the food that we normally provide, burgers, dogs, vegetarian options, et cetera. We will do safe, uh, say every safety precaution involved as far as serving the food, eating the food in the open air. Well, and we do hope to follow things up with, with a um, observing session, but it will not be a communal observing session. Everybody can set up their telescopes on the field at Stargate at a safe distance. No sharing telescopes, especially no sharing of eyepieces. <clears throat> so it'll be a little different, but we're, we are determined to have a good, safe, and fun event <clears throat> that for many of us, the first time that we've seen one another face to face since the very beginning of March. So um, keep, keep an eye out for that. Um, the, there will be a special email blast going out regarding the picnic in general uh, with all of the instructions on how we are going to conduct it safely. And the day is going to be August, August 22nd. The 22nd, yes. And the reason for that, Jonathan? Uh, it's the 50th anniversary it's the week of the 50th anniversary of the first open house at Stargate. So you can see why we felt that that was incredibly important to the club as an institution to do the best job that we can with the picnic. And um, I'd like to hand things over to our in the news and the sky presenter who is also our first vice president dale could you take it away with the news i hope so that's wrong um, can you hear me we can okay um i'm going to try to make this work unless you want to put it up jonathan i emailed it to you i think so uh, i my uh, my data is uh my data is somewhat uh limited right now so i let's okay let me let's, let me uh, try this yeah. let me try um can we still hear you i'm here can you see my screen yes. uh, okay in the news um <laughs> We can't see your what? screen, we can just see you. Oh, I tried to share my screen. Let me try again. Um, does that help? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so I think most of us have heard that the universe is supposed to be about 13.8 billion years old. That's based on um, studies of the cosmic microwave background radiation by various satellites, most recently the European Planck satellite, 13.8. However, uh, recent measurements 
of type 1a supernovas in distant parts of the universe gave an age that was several percent smaller so there seems to be something unresolved in our understanding of the early universe uh, so there's been a new research uh, based on an international team of astrophysicists uh, who say they get agreement of 13.8 billion years using observations of the Atacama Cosmology Telescope in Chile. Uh, so this is an ongoing controversy, and I think it could, it has a potential to be, you know, tell us something new about the early universe, depending on how these measurements are resolved. Um, Here's one I had not heard before. There's a team of scientists at Harvard University and elsewhere uh, who are suggesting that Planet Nine, if there is such a thing that seems to be perturbing the orbits of objects out in the Kuiper Belt, uh, could be a black hole, uh, a primordial black hole with a mass several times the mass of the Earth. Um, so the question is, if, if that's what it is, then that sort of explains why you can't see it, except you could see it when things bump into it, like a comet coming in from the Oort cloud. So uh, there's a LSST telescope that's going to map the whole sky very frequently a very wide field of view and what they're going to be looking for is accretion flares um, radiation given off when something uh, falls into or goes into orbit around and slowly falls into a black hole so it's a new way to look for planet nine if there is such a planet uh this one i thought was interesting the united arab emirates is launching its first mission to mars uh the emirates mars mission which consists of an orbiter uh, orbit mars called hope uh, is uh, set to launch within a few days um, and uh its mission at Mars will be to study its atmosphere and weather. It won't be the first to do that. Uh, it's uh, being sent up by a Japanese rocket. I've read they would have been happy to consider uh, using uh, the SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket, except that rocket wasn't ready when they were planning for this mission. Um, and I think what's interesting here is the Arab world was, you know, a premier leader of science, including astronomy. Back in the 800 to 1300 AD timeframe. And uh, they stopped doing very much science after that certainly in the field of astronomy and uh, this represents a step toward the arab muslim world uh turning back into doing some real astronomy so i think and they've talked about uh in the future wanting to send people to mars not real soon because they've got a long way to go on that but that's their goal they want to send people to mars so they're sort of joining the community of people who are interested in doing astronomy i thought that was kind of interesting uh on the other hand on the negative side Seems like there's just one delay after the next on the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, it was supposed to launch next March. Now they're talking about October next year. 
partially due to the coronavirus pandemic. I think they're only saying partially, so there's there have to be some technical problems involved. Again, I'm. What can I say? Uh, I'll try to be fairly nice and say they certainly seem to have had their problems. Um, this this telescope has been in the works since 1996. That's 24 years ago. And the budget has gone from half a billion to almost 10 billion. That's a factor of 20. Some people seem to be, by the time this thing launches and they start collecting data, it will be their whole career. It's amazing. <laughs> Let's talk about in the sky. I think the big story everybody knows is Comet Neowise. Uh, if you wonder where it got such a name, it was first spotted uh, in March by astronomers using an infrared telescope called Neowise. And we won't be seeing this comet anytime soon after this time around because it takes almost 7,000 years to go around the sun once. Uh, I put up this picture because you can see the two tails of the comet. There's a white dust tail and a blue ion tail. Normally, if you don't do photography, you can't see the ion tail of a comet, but with photography, you often can. Um, the white dust tail is goes in a direction controlled by uh, the pressure of sunlight. Uh, the ion, blue ion tail is controlled by the solar wind, the direction it goes, which is a slightly different direction. So if you want to see it, some of you I know already have. Um, John Blum sent around an email just a couple days ago saying he had seen it. Um, here's a chart if, if you want to see it in the evening, a little over an hour after sundown. Uh, those are the numbers you see there are dates in July. So it's sort of getting better, easier to see it over the next few days. Look to the northwest below the Big Dipper. Uh, Apparently, the best way to see it is start with some wide angle binoculars and then also look with your bare eye. Um, I'm ashamed to say I haven't had a chance to see it myself. Uh, I will be out tonight if the sky is clear and I will be watching every night until I get to see it. I hope you will too. Uh, you can also see it before dawn. Uh, if you're an early riser, um, this is what it will look like or where it will be uh, tomorrow morning, as seen from the US, looking northeast 45 minutes to an hour before sunrise. And it will be moving to the left of the indicated position each day after that. So the big story in the sky is Comet Neowise. I can't resi resist stating what to many is obvious. Jupiter and Saturn are just spectacularly positioned for some very nice viewing. Um, I have a little 72 inch refractor set up at one window of my house that I can slide open and if I get up at night, I can't resist taking a look, seeing the rings of Saturn and the moons of Jupiter. So enjoy. That's uh, in the sky for tonight. Thank and you very thank much. You. Thank you very much, Dale. And I am hoping that we've got some observing reports that we can get in, though we are going to do a slightly accelerated schedule tonight because we would like all of you to have the opportunity wherever you are to go out and look 
for Neo Wise. So um, we will now have the officer report to personalize the meetings. And because we don't have a time limit on the library room, we will be having the officers read their reports with one exception, um, the way that we normally would on a Monday meeting. So Dale, I will pass it right back to you for the first vice president's report. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Diane. Um, on at our next meeting on August the third, uh, Jeff McLeod will be speaking on an enticing topic: the moon is not boring, and other lunar misconceptions. Um, th that same day, John Blum will be speaking on with a short presentation on uh, the best online and offline resources for astronomers. And then uh, on August the 20th, John Dumar will be speaking on the extensive studies he's done uh, modeling the Galilean uh, moon orbits. So that's what's coming in the near future. Thank you, Dale. And now I'd like to pass it to our second vice president, Observatory Chair Rian Mahdi. Uh, hi, Diane. Thank you. Um, and hello, everyone. I um, visited the observatory yesterday. Um, both buildings and all equipment are in good shape. I did notice a little bit of a stain on the carpet, uh, maybe from water droplets um, in front of the safe but um, i looked up i didn't really see any holes or any major problems uh, with the dome or, or the roof so maybe some water just got in from uh, from a little bit of rain uh, which we can take care of um other than that yeah um, the uh, wasps uh, wasps have uh, taken over of course i was <laughs> trying to clean uh, the floor a little bit uh, clean the building but um, yeah I had to get out of there <laughs> they were not having me over <laughs> for uh, for a visitor so um, next time when we go there before the picnic uh, I guess we need to bring um, some uh, preventative measures with us and uh, see if we can evict them at least uh, for for that day um, other than that yeah the uh, of course the observatory is still um, uh, closed uh, for now uh, and, and until we uh, decide to reopen it uh, and that's going to depend on the conditions in the state uh, and, and what we hear from uh, the local government um, and hopefully we can do all of this uh, in a safe uh, safe way um, other than that i really don't uh, don't have anything else right now i, I did submit a, a report uh, also uh, on that uh, today thank you very much Riyadh. Um, our secretary glenn uh did choose to submit his report electronically the monday meeting minutes were completed sent out for board review uh, Glenn will be supporting the next virtual meeting, which is tonight. There were three undeliverable and returned big letters that he from last year's banquet that he is following up on. Um, two of these institutions have updated addresses. The other one, sadly, has gone out of business. So that is anything else. Um, last month's minutes are in the wasp. Uh, is Mark Jacobson Diane, a I, on the uh, Diane, yes. you, know, you are the host, so you're the only one who can mute people who are making noise, just so you know. Okay. All right. Um, do we have uh, Mark Jacobison on the line? I didn't think I saw, I could see him earlier. Mark's report is in the wasp there has not been any significant change since last week regarding the treasury um bob trembley with outreach too many windows open hi everyone um well i haven't been doing a whole lot of outreach but uh <laughs> I, uh, I did finally crack out my telescope and uh, I, I am I'm insomnia, so I wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning and the uh, third quarter moon was absolutely beautiful the other day. So I set up my tiny little scope and brought out my father-in-law who is elderly and also has insomnia and showed him the third quarter moon. So that was pretty cool. Um, 
I heard the library across the street here is opening up, and I'm like, oh, I wonder if they're doing presentations, but I'm not sure how that would work. And speaking of presentations, this is something uh, the board uh, <clears throat> talked about. We got a request uh, for outreach, uh, bring somebody bring telescopes and stuff. We as a club really can't support that at this time, but we can't stop you from doing it. So if you want to go do outreach, great. Um, don't say you're from the Warren Astronomical Society, or at least don't push it very hard. And uh, if you do go do that, please be sure that you're practicing, you know, the safe distancing and masks and all that <clears throat> stuff. Um, got email from Sally. Um, how do you pronounce that again, Jonathan? I'll never get it right. Oi, we. How, how do you Ooh -wee. pronounce that? Oui. 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 I'm gonna write that down. Anyway, and uh, on July 21st at 7 p.m., Ann Arbor City Planning Commission will be reviewing a draft lighting ordinance, and hopefully take a vote to review. Uh, review. They're having a Zoom meeting, and they would like some supporters. So if you're in the Ann Arbor area and you care about light pollution, there's a Zoom meeting happening. I can send you information on that. Um, it looks like. Um, they're putting out a feeler for nominating Belle Isle in Detroit as an urban dark sky place, and they are looking for some interest and help. <clears throat> they uh, were hoping to meet with the DNR again soon. A fellow by the name of Jerry has been and working on that, and, and there's a couple other things here on that. Um, I know that Ken Burton said he was going to be doing some outreach. Ken, do you have a report on that? How, how did that go? And if anybody else has done any outreach, um, chime I, in, please. I, I spoke before the the low browse. I did a presentation on Max Fleischer. It was well received. It uh, it went well. I also did a uh, report uh, with the Oakland Club uh, about the week before, and uh, also both of them were done by Zoom, and uh, the uh, all of them have gone pretty well so far. I'm pretty much scheduled uh, for several other uh, clubs. The Ford Club has also talked to me about uh, bringing up another presentation. I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking at, uh, in the future, uh, um, ex expanding on the, uh, on the debate we had in the fact that I'm planning on putting up to get a, a, another speech uh, very, uh, within whenever Dale could give me a date uh, on uh, the cost of actually sending people out into space uh, less about uh, my opinions about what you whether we should do it or not but there is the but there is the uh, the is the cost factor and I'm trying to make it so that one can see the difference between doing it robotically and doing it uh, with human beings and uh, that that it's also on the agenda I've talked to the low brows about it as well and they're interested in becoming to them but of course yeah. war the Warren Club goes first and uh, that's the story. I seriously have to start getting off, getting off my chair and start doing some online presentations. Yeah. But anyway, it's it's, it's Bob, fun to do. It's good. Bob, uh, yes, Shedlowski here uh, tomorrow night. For anybody interested, I'm uh, doing my evolution of giant telescopes to to the uh, uh, low bronze club. I'll uh, I'll post the the meeting notice if anybody's interested. You you. This, this is the one I did a couple of years ago for you guys. So. Okay. And uh, uh, for Ken, uh, it's already been done. It's already been done, Ken. So the, guys, the cost, the cost I, of I brought this up at the last meeting. This is officer reports. If you have something to tell Bob, please email him. Do not put it in the main <laughs> part of the meeting. We, Diane, he asked us to. I know, but he, he asked, but get it in to him so he can be incorporated as part of his official report what did you do uh, we we really do have to move on anyway um that's pretty much all i have all right and publications the wasp is up that's great. All right. Um, moving on to subgroup reports. Uh, spoke with Solar Marty last night. And while the sun is not particularly interesting, uh, we had a good discussion on his feeling that this is not as severe as solar minimums, the last one we experienced. And there are signs of good things to come on the sun, so stay tuned. 
In the meantime, if you want to look at the sun, check out the latest pictures released by the solar probe, which will blow your mind. Um, Bill Beers, you are on the line. Would you like to give us an update on astrophotography? Sure. Hi, how are you doing? Everybody's talking about comet Neowise, and they should be. Probably by now, most everybody has seen it. Uh, but if you haven't and you want to take some pictures of it, this is a perfect object to take an astral photo of with your DSL camera. Just take it out there, set it up in a tripod. Uh, comet Neowise is about 10 o'clock tonight. It's uh, south of uh, the Big Dipper. So locate it with binoculars, then uh, start with probably a 10-second exposure and then work your way up there. It's pretty bright, and it's a beautiful astrophotography object. So I highly recommend you get your cameras out there. That's it. Fabulous. Thank you, Bill. And... Um... Discussion group, of course, is on hold for the time being. We've got um, Merchandise Astronomical League. Anything to add? Uh, nothing at this time. I'm uh, throwing myself on the mercy of the Astronomical League. Okay. And Riyadh, of, of course, the Double Star Group is free to meet whenever they choose, correct? But we are certainly not hosting at Stargate anytime soon. Yeah, and if uh, anybody is interested in going to Stargate, uh, just to uh, remind everyone, um, they're closing the uh, camp early, usually in the evening now, so before it even gets dark is my understanding, so maybe it's not a place to go. And if you do go somewhere, just follow the uh, normal, uh, or the new, I, I guess I should say, uh, means of uh, protecting yourself and others around you. Um, so we'll leave it at that. Very good, yes. Um, we are getting requests from people about going out to Stargate on their own since there is something to see. Um, we'll have to get that word out a little more strongly that the park is not following its normal hours. All right, so it is now time to move into the observing reports. I'm sure we have a few. Who would like to go first? So I accidentally sh uh, shared a, an astro photo I took of the comet uh, through a 10 inch with my cell phone. Uh, I actually got some really great shots uh, with my cell phone through a 66 millimeter telescope on Michigan Avenue and Outer Drive in Dearborn, uh, which, you know, if you know what Michigan Avenue and Outer Drive in Dearborn is like, uh, it's pretty impressive. It's a really bright comet. So if you haven't seen it, I strongly encourage you to just keep trying until you do see it. And then every night afterwards, keep trying because you'll really enjoy it. Uh, I see Diane. Uh, oh, ah, she is conveying to me the words of the Ross. Uh, so I will get into the gary ross's observing reports uh 8th of july beginning at approximately 400 hours ut fine sky at, after heavy midday rain jupiter at approximately 160 times magnification gnarled north equatorial belt with large feature at central meridian the southern hemisphere hood well presented but without discernible texture or features Again, this feature extends to the south temperate belt, but there is no analog in the northern hemisphere. Question, does the turbulence in the north equatorial belt inveigh against belt formation in north, higher northern latitude? That is a question above my pay grade. Ganymede and Europa are proximate, hence the size difference between them is obvious. Color two, that is, Ganymede is yellowish, but the ice moon is anti-color. On the 10th of July, early morning thunderstorm, very clear in the late evening, seeing poor on Jupiter at approximately 160 times, very little to see on the disk, save no unusual activity on North Equatorial Belt. Great red spot not present. Amazing display of satellites, five and all, all objects to west of the ball, plus a star, possibly eighth magnitude, midway in the lineup. Europa and Ganymede do one another, size difference of note. 
Europa seemed dull and non-luster. Callisto, not blue. Supplemental, M22 at 65 times, scattering the bright population two stars across the cluster, but seemingly a wall of them across it. If you haven't looked at M22 this summer, this is your call to do so, because it's one of the greatest globular clusters, even if it is a little bit of a mess when you put too much aperture on it. 14th of July, very still and reasonably clear, Jupiter on meridian. Seeing good, north equatorial belt, dark and moderately active, but no prominent knots or eruptions. South equatorial belt, quiescent, but bifurcated in latitude. South temperate belt, well-developed. Satellite's quite a study. Obvious size difference between Io and Ganymede. Ganymede is 5,300 kilometers in diameter, while Io is only 3,600 kilometers. The former is a real world, the other is just a moon. To the west, a contrast of albedos, Callisto 0.17, Europa 0.67, which makes Europa seem bigger than actual in relation to Callisto. Mars is strongly gibbous. South polar cap region is huge. Below it, and immediately to the right of the Terminator, is the complex of Mare Erythrium and Aurorae Sinus, Sinus, all well presented. These features dominate the southern hemisphere, but nothing in the north. All observations made by hand-driven telescope with hand-me-down eyepiece, gift from once handsome Joe McBride, not multi-coded, not airspace with argon, not five elements. Although from the lawn of the James C.V. Observatory, said field study could have been made from a purgatorial backyard in Roseville, or a backyard in purgatorial Farmington Hills, so long as the owner was not inside more concerned why his live-streaming 5G satellite channel on all wall flat screen showed not a bit snow with Korean su subtitles. And that is the word of Ross. Please, somebody else, call up and beat that. Well, given what we've got in the sky, somebody might be able to. Who would like to follow that with an observing report? I, I have one. I've got a, a picture here of, um, of the, with an iPhone with no uh, anything. Just I just took it, and it's... Uh, I've got it here. If you want, can you switch me to get that uh, on there? Just, just hit the, the upload button. I did. Uh, you can just upload a picture. Okay, it looks like it's starting. Yeah. Okay, there it goes. Okay, and it's it's this is just a standard, this is just a standard shot of it, um, that uh, just with my iPhone, and I just uh, took the picture and blew it up a little bit, and that's it. You see it? Okay. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. nice. So it was and just. And that was from just, what city? Well, I was in West Bloomfield at the Drake West Field. Drake, Drake Field. I was there at 4.30 in the morning and uh, just said, oh, I'll take a shot. I got I saw it with the binoculars. It was fabulous, of course. And then I just said, oh, let's take a shot at it. And I took it and brought it home and I kind of doctored it a little bit. It's certainly not very good, but it's uh, but you can do it with a regular cell phone, obviously. And there you go. Hello, and, you look great, Kenny. What's that? You look great. Yeah. Ken, is that... Uh, is that is that Drake Road and 12 Mile? It's 12 Mile. No, it's Drake. Drake uh, Field is at 15 Mile Road and Drake. Okay. And uh, there was a Little Caesars soccer field at 12 and Drake that yeah. I thought they built something on, but that's what I used to use for comments. Well, what we did is it just gave a nice clear shot to the north. It was the north, uh, northeast, I guess, at that time. And uh, there was another fellow out there, and he says, I can't find it. And I had my mask on. He did too. And I said, Here, take my binoculars. And I said, there it is right there. And he looked at it and he said, whoa, like, it was really kind of cool. Anyway, so very nice. And I'm although go sharing, sharing oculars seems to be a bad idea, although who knows? Yeah, really. yeah but, I know. I get it. But yeah. it, it was impulsive. That was no question about it. But, but, I know. It's but, killing know. me not to show people this comment. Yeah, I, it is. But anyway. I so, want a refund. All these years without a bright comment. And we have a bright comment and we can't have any events. That's it. That's I want right. a refund. Anyway, there was an also a police officer that came by who wanted to check our stuff. And they said, we're looking at the comedy. He said, oh, yeah, I've seen a lot of people doing that this morning. So it was, so apparently there's a lot of people looking for it. Good it's deal. Excellent. Great event. Okay. That's Very good. Done. Okay. All right. Any other observing reports? I'd like to end this portion of the meeting in four minutes. So I think we can fit in at least two more people. Well, I just joined. Hi, everybody. Hey. Decided, Hello, Adrian. Yep, I decided to make my comment serving brief by just throwing 
one of my pictures is my background. And, um, you've probably seen a bunch of images I put up of the comet. And this one, I'll get out of your way. This one is the probably the coolest looking one. It also it's backwards. sorry, Ken. I'm trying to still, get Ken is still sharing uh, his screen. Mm, there okay. we go. There we go. Oh. All right. So I'll talk so you can see it. Yeah, it's uh, it's backwards from the way it looks. I found Lake Hudson when it's really clear to be perhaps <laughs> one of the best places to view it um just because it's you know any dark sky park things or things show up it it popped out at me easily without i got out of the truck looked and went oh wow there it is and so i hurried to get set up and start taking some photos during the morning i was using settings that seemed to work better for daytime photography i was shooting common iso 100 and things like that at night, I was using the more familiar, longer exposures and higher ISOs. And um, one of my plans, if it if it's not cloudy, is to um, try and shoot it with a true astrophotography aim where you give it several frames uh, and stack it and see if I can get an ion, ion tail. But um, I've lost a lot of sleep chasing this comet, but it's been worth it. That's Adrian, that's a great, shot. great shot, Adrian. When did you take it? This was two nights ago, I think. Um, two nights ago at Lake Hudson. Um, and this one, I'm trying to remember what lens I used, but it, I, I was using a larger lens to capture the comet and expose it so I could capture the uh, sky as well. But yeah, two nights, let's see, two nights or maybe three. Uh, three nights ago at Lake Hudson, <clears throat> Christine. Two nights ago, it wasn't so good. And then Adrian, the tail of the before. comet seems to be tipped. When I looked at it here in Waterford, it was almost straight up and down. Anybody else? So it depends on when you see the comet. At night, the comet will be at that angle. It'll be facing the other way, but it'll be at that angle. Um, the sun facing the sun, which sets over here. In the morning, as it rises, it's at a more, it's a, exactly. it's actually but, really at that angle because it's rising with the sun. Okay. So it, it depends on when you see it and what angle it'll be at. It was in the morning, so that's explained yep, it. Thanks. So that's why, yep. Yeah, at nighttime, it, it presents a different angle and um, in a different face. It's ironic because this is actually what, before it finally sets, this is probably what it'll look like to you in the morning flipped over like this so um so yeah it depends on when you see it i have a report okay hey. well, <laughs> yeah. quickly. Um, i haven't seen it very well in the evening sky i also just spent a half an hour trying to get the uh, sound working and i finally did but um on the morning sky it was just gorgeous with uh, the dust tail so, so bright, no real sense of an ion tail yet. But when I'm looking at it, I'm it's reminding me of um, of uh, the great comet of, four, of 44 BC that took place just after Caesar was assassinated, which brings me back to um, to Julius Caesar, where Calpurnius says, when beggars die, there are no comets seen. <laughs> The heavens themselves blaze forth the death of princes. This is a really princely comet. Uh oh. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> That's beautiful and terrifying, but I guess comets do that. Yeah. So um, we will now convene our informal snack break a little bit early. Uh, <laughs> If there are any questions, we will endeavor to answer them after the presentation to allow um, any questions coming in from YouTube, et cetera, so that um, we can get anybody who wants to go hunting Neowise out the door. So we'll see you all in 10 minutes for the main presentation. <clears throat> so, David. Um... I actually think the presence of this comet 
Um, I would say maybe it's a signal. Remember, we have COVID-19 going on, <coughs> so I think it's fitting the size and magnitude of the situation we have on Earth now. This comet seems to fit that bill. Comet hail bop. I don't remember anything major going on other than a couple of movies that were depicting doom and gloom. But I don't remember if there was any real doom and gloom in the uh, in the late '90s when Hale Bop was here. Uh, so I guess we had to make it. But this one, this one is actually coming with a uh, with an interesting uh, interesting story on Earth happening right before. Well, it's also predicting stuff, and so it may be it may be predicting something coming. But I'd just like to see that it's to feel that the comet is here just to, for us to enjoy. And let's hope that's all it is. I have a, I have a, I have a shot here from, uh, from Bob Slobins, who's a very, very well known. Uh, I'll bet you, David, you probably met Bob Slobins. Uh, anyway, uh, Bob, this is a shot from Bob Slobins, who's a, who's a real professional uh, photographer. And uh, he sent this over to me, and he said this was a really nice shot uh, in the evening. Thought you might get a kick out of that. I haven't really seen it much in the evening yet, but we're further south, so yep. we need to wait a couple more days. This must be an early evening um, because of the angle of that comet, straight up and down. Yeah, it, um, uh, yeah, it was early. Yeah, evening the angle, the act. Yeah, someone just posted the angle of the comet. My observation: the angle of the comet is actually lower in the sky, like you're seeing in my picture, but in reverse uh -huh. in the evening. And in the morning, it's more straight up and down. Does so. that look like a morning picture? Yeah, I think it is yeah. in a morning picture. It is a morning picture. Yeah, okay. he just, I, I got a note from him. Yeah, I just looked at it. It is in a morning picture. And yeah, then there's, yeah. there's, there's also one that I have from uh, Fred Espinak. Uh, this I one, heard that this name is, too. This, this yeah, is that comet was framed beautifully against the cloud bank just below yeah. it. So it rose out of those clouds. Let me so see if that, I can get this one. I saw I saw what he was doing. What uh, the other photographer was doing. Now this is this is from Portal, Arizona. Is it doing it yet? Yeah, there it is. Uh, yeah, this is from Portal, that. Arizona, and I believe that is the evening chart shot, right? Not if it's that's actually a very recent morning shot, just based right, on okay. the angle. Right, I, agree. I think you're right. Yeah, it's the morning. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, but I got that from him. From yeah, uh, it's a Esperac. beautiful morning shot. It's the comet. He's caught basically the perfect spot of the comet. There's still a few stars here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think clouds are obscuring the sun a bit. So he's actually able to get a uh, brighter comet shot. So, this is this is from well Portal. Done. This is from Portal, Arizona, which is uh, uh, near the New Mexico border. Um, and they're out in a place that uh, all the houses out there are all. Uh, uh, built for people who want to do astronomy because it's real crystal clear out there. Yeah, and, uh, that came from Fred. I thought you'd get a yeah, check out I of can. that one too. He's uh, he's quite a photographer. You, David, you know him very well. I know. Oh, oh yeah, and that's, this is a wonderful picture you're showing. Yeah. All the pictures that I've seen have been wonderful. And in fact, for the last 45 minutes, while I wasn't able to get any sound, I still was able to enjoy the pictures of the comet. They're just. Uh, they're just really, uh, really something. So anyway, I just wanted you to see that as well. And I'm going to stop sharing and I'm back. Okay. Yeah, I, just... I know I've posted a few on my Facebook page. Um, and I've got a couple that are yet in my camera to see if I can process those. Uh, another evening shot that's still sitting on my uh, card that I haven't uploaded yet. But um. I took a couple of them that night. It was murky when the comet emerged from the clouds. I went ahead and took a couple shots of it and then just put it in binoculars and said, I'll just observe it from here. Are you, are you recommending a 10 second, uh, a 10 second exposure? Generally speaking, I heard Doug say that. Yeah. At night, do a 10 second exposure during the day. If you, if it's still morning, you don't need as many seconds exposure. You may not even need as high an ISO. But at okay. night, 10 seconds. And I start your ISO at 1600 or go higher and okay. um, see what you get. 
and then just adjust. It's uh, at night, it becomes, a, you know, what a, like a second magnitude. It well, it's plus two, so it's it's like it's like uh, imaging for Sirius the star. It's, ah, it's it okay. gets that bright. I so see. okay, yeah, ten seconds is a good place to start at sixteen hundred ISO. You're saying yeah. Okay. I use your your f stop your aperture. Start with it as wide as you want, and okay. then you can you can cut it down. The cameo appearance by uh, John and Diane yeah. Field. Um, yeah. yeah, cut your ISO down to taste, but you can start with it wide open, okay. like you're trying, like you're imaging the star field. Got it. Okay. And then see what it. happens. And I found up. I have an, uh, an a Nikon D seventy that I've had for years, and I put it away. And then I tried to turn it on the other day, and the battery is dead. <laughs> so <laughs> gotta, gotta charge the battery. Gotta charge the battery. <laughs> that's uh, that's disappointing when you're like, yeah. okay, I'm gonna go get a. I'm gonna no, do no. that now, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was something. Okay. Uh, All right, I'm gonna do that in the next few days. So, looking forward to it. But that's why. That's because I have. But I have these friends like uh, Doug Bach and. Fred Espinac and uh, Slogan. Yeah, that know what they're doing. So if I don't do it, <laughs> I know I can get something. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I was, yeah, I'm looking at the chat and I'm responding to uh, Klarner saying, you yeah, know, I think it's actually at different angles. Uh, my picture uh, is, mirror, is a mirror image of what it really is because I'm using it as a virtual background here. Okay. Um, right. I think it's, it actually looks like that in the morning, but it goes the other way in the evening. It's based, it flip flops but because it's pointing away from the sun, of course. So as the sun sets, then the comet comes into view and it's, you know, it's angling toward the Northwest tail flowing out toward the North. The, yep. um, Comments on the northeast side, tail flowing toward the north and angled toward the sun as it's rising. Well, the plasma tail, of course, gets wiped out a little bit, of course, with being low on the horizon, I guess, because yes. of the colors, right? So I would assume that that would be a, unless it's higher in the sky, you're going to have a lot of trouble picking right. up the plasma. Yeah. Okay. And now, hey, Adrian. Yeah. Yeah, so when I look, see, this is, this, is the, this is what I was wondering. When I went out before 12, and I went out in the morning and watched it, it came in just like the picture that you have in the background. That's what I observed when I was out looking at it. And then when I went out after the 12th, I think it was Monday night when we had that really good, clear night, Yeah, I noticed that in the northwest sky, it looked exactly like it does in the picture that you have. And that's what confused me. I thought... If it's going, if it's already made its way around the sun, then it should be tailing the other way, and that's why I'm looking, thinking, and that's what's had me confused the last two days because I'm a visual learner, so I'm trying to put all these objects together and try yeah. to figure out how you know it comes around. Mm -hmm. I would have to go back out. We're getting some really, really clear sky right now. I'm at my son's baseball game, but we're getting some okay. really, really clear sky right now, and it's like, um. I'm going to have to go back out tonight and look at it because yeah. when I looked at it the other night, it looked just like that picture. And I thought, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. So that's why I like that I said, my picture because... flipped around for nighttime. So it's, um, yeah. I'm blocking it now. There we go. Um, yeah. yeah. It, well, it's, it's, if it's clearing up, it's worth, you know, that's why it's there to observe and to take yeah. notes. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it's very faint. All I have is a pair of cheap binoculars. So. Yeah, so I can but, still make uh, out the tail and everything else. So. Yeah, you're still seeing it. So, so I'm gonna have to get out tonight and check it, and then maybe I'll have to get up. Is it still observable in the morning then? I think barely. I think it depends on where you are in the states. The further south you are, I think the more likely it's still gonna be visible in the morning. But here, um, 42nd, almost you know, 42nd parallel, we're um, we're losing it. It's yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and I'm an hour north of you guys, so. Yeah, so. yeah. I'd say it's but pretty feel, much an evening object for you. Yeah, I'm going to go and check that out again. But like I said, I went out the one morning, and it looked just like the picture you have both, yeah. on, both times. 
morning and night, it looked like the same picture. Okay. Um, and so I thought that was odd, but I thought, well, if it's going around the yeah. why is the tail? All right, everybody. We have some very lively discussion so, going on about comments, but uh, it is time to reconvene so we can proceed with the main presentation for the night. Um, do I see Dr. Dale Parton back so I can hand him the baton for introducing the speaker? There you are. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Diane. Uh, so our speaker tonight is Jonathan Cade. Uh, he is currently our publications officer. Um, and he served on the board a lot, uh, most years since 2008. Um, he's been president. He's been the first vice president in charge of program. And I don't remember what else he's been, but He's, he's really been uh, a major person in our club. Uh, he is a part-time resident of Black River, Michigan since 1988. And he is in love with Michigan's sunrise side, still wonderful skies there. He and our president, Diane Hall, are in the process of starting Dark Skies Alcona, an organization aimed at promoting and protecting the dark skies of Alcona County. Thank you very much. Um, tonight, Jonathan is gonna talk about interstellar objects I have sort of known. Jonathan, you're on. I see his window spinning and spinning, so there may be a short delay. We can't hear you. You're just spinning. Yeah. I'm thinking right now, Diane. Uh, there we go. You're coming in. Is it working now? Okay. We'll see how this goes. I'll switch if if I have to. I I hear myself echoed on Diane's uh, computer, so let me go close the door. All right, we'll see see if this works. Uh, could I ask uh, if you're not uh, presenting, uh, could you turn off your video? Are you guys run in that uh, storage garage where we keep that big telescope in that park? <laughs> uh, can somebody? All right, can you still hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can. All right, and can you see, can you see my presentation? Yeah. All right. Good. And you must have been over to your computer. Uh, I cannot see right. your presentation. So, I cannot see your presentation. It's in it's the start, it's, it's the starting to share by now. It says starting yeah. share in here. Yeah, it's in the state of starting to share content. All right. Is everyone uh you see any has everyone turned off their video? Yes, I have. Yep. Yeah, turn it off. Turn it off, everyone. The videos appear to be turned off, where some of us are getting low bandwidth warnings. 
Uh oh. I guess my presentation is your audio is on. Alan Kaplan's audio is on. Yes. Okay, let's try that again. Is this better? Anybody who still has audio? Did I start this time? I think you're I think you're undergoing some sort of a blip in your uplink to us. Because you were just fine. Okay. I know you both but um there it goes. There we go. We got there it. There we go. Yay. Okay. Hooray. Hooray. And but I do get the presentation ready in case I need to run over there. Okay. All right, so this presentation is about interstellar objects I have sort of known. Uh, and you'll see why I say that in a minute. Uh, but we're going to be talking about a number of different types of objects. But before we get into the objects part of it, let's talk about what interstellar means. Um, before we talk about interstellar, I think we should take a system. So part of the solar system all of you are intimately familiar with. This is actually uh, two scale and two size, but not both at the same time. So so the sizes and sizes are not <laughs> scale. Uh, so, so you can see Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are really close in. Jupiter is much further out. Saturn is further out again. Whoever's pinging, whoever's sending messages, I cannot see what you're messaging me about. Um, and uh, so that's, those are the classic, those are the planets that uh, the IAU definition recognizes. If we go out a little further, you see that yellow path uh, cutting through an angle, that's Pluto. And Pluto is a member of the Kuiper Belt, along with many, many, many other objects, including a lot of cool comets, no pun intended. And uh, beyond that, we get to sort of solar dynamic edges. So the sun, the solar wind, sort of hits a point where the interstellar wind actually pushes back from it. And you'll see that uh, there's uh, you see that there's something called a bow wave. Uh, in older diagrams, you'll see that called a bow shock, uh, and that is not uh, something that exists anymore. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, I hear. I I hope the uh, seagulls are enjoying this presentation too. Uh, and the the solar dynamic environment, we start to enter the interstellar medium, and from there we hit the Oort cloud. And the edges of the Oort cloud are not well known at present. Uh, we think that uh, the inner edge of the local cloud is about two time uh, ten to the third, you know, 10, ten to the third uh, astronomical units. And uh, the outer edge is actually 10 to the fifth astronomical units. And it almost reaches to the nearest large star, Alpha Centauri. So, so that's sort of a, a, a number of different views of the solar system. And so that might make you ask, where is the interstellar boundary? Like, do you consider the disk of the solar system to be the, uh, inter the solar system uh, boundary? Uh, nobody really uses this definition. So it is, it, it is a neat thing. I hear my audio is spotty, so I'll see if there's anything I can do about that. Uh, I'm going to switch back for just a second and see if I can improve that. Mm. Test check, test check. Let me try to increase. 
<laughs> Can you hear me any better now? All right. Uh, so now the technical program, I hope uh, I hope that you can uh, you know deal with all of the intense science happening with the solar solar winds sort of hitting up against the interstellar medium. And uh, and the edge of the sun's gravitational influence and where the sun starts uh, performing better. Uh oh, I'm having having my system here, so uh, I'm going to stop sharing uh, and chat amongst yourselves for a second. I'll be right back with you. Song and dance time or what? Just chat amongst ourselves. I could play the ukulele. <laughs> Joking. <laughs> Don't we love technology? Catherine's uh, mic is uh, on. <clears throat> I have a bunch of uh, Dixie cups if anybody's got some string. I know. Yeah. Yeah, I think Catherine Mike was the only one on during the presentation. Mm -hmm. No? Oh, ah. yeah, I just, I, did, I didn't notice any headset on her, but I didn't notice any microphone either, crossed out either, so wondering how she was connected. Hmm. So the best time to see it, then it's um, that 4.30 in the morning, yeah? No, it's actually now. Right now? Right no. now. Well, so we the meeting right now. But it's still big time outside. Gosh darn it. <laughs> Northway. Oh, thank you. Thank Honestly, you so much. <laughs> after 10 p.m. <laughs> I'm sure. better. Unless you're in Chicago. <laughs> you're in Chicago. <laughs> Can you hear me better now, now that I'm on Diane's computer? Yes. I think way, better. Saying. way better. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Okay. Uh, so, so how bad was it? Would you like me to start over from the very beginning? I heard you make it if I try. I'll do that. Yeah, you we, we got most of what you were talking about. Yeah. All right. Here I go. All right. So what does interstellar mean? Blah, 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 blah. All right. All right. So we got to, uh, we got to the interstellar medium. Uh, so, so the Oort cloud is a shell around the, around our solar system uh, in 360 degrees, not just in the plane of the solar system. And that's where our gravitational, the sphere of our sun's gravitational influence extends. So that's another uh, boundary that is commonly called interstellar. Uh, so that will become meaningful in a second. Uh, so first, let's talk about the interstellar objects that humans are responsible for. And those are interstellar objects according to the second definition, which is the solar dynamic environment. So uh, Voyager 2 is the uh, first of those. I just realized that my notes are also all on my phone. Uh, so Voyager 2 uh, launched on August 20th, 1977. And uh, so it launched four years before Diane and I, three years before Diane did, and four years before I did. Um, and uh, Voyager 2 actually launched before Voyager 1, and this is a shot 
Uh, this is a simulation of what Voyager is seeing as it looks back at home, weeping, cold and alone in the dark void, winding down and weeping. That's a quote from a song. Um, so, uh, and Voyager 1 launched on September 5th, 1977. And uh, so on, uh, from those points, you know, they were mostly intended to survey our solar system and take pictures of the outer reaches that we had never seen in close detail before. We had sent the Pioneer 11, 10 and 11 craft out there, but uh, Voyager was a whole new technological revolution. It allowed us to see things that we had never seen before. And I don't know if how many people uh, remember how shocking it was to see Uranus up close and to see Neptune up close when the Voyagers got out there. But it was really tremendous. Um, so the Voyagers are now alone together in the interstellar medium. They have left the solar dynamic environment and now they're floating out in the interstellar wind. Uh, they are the first two human spacecraft to reach interstellar space. And uh, what's important to note, though, is that they haven't left the solar system. If you search for Voyager leaves solar system, you will find hundreds of articles, thousands of articles from reputable publications saying that the Voyagers have left the solar system. It's not true. The Voyagers have let our interstellar in that they've left the sphere of the sun's wind, but they have they will not leave our solar system for quite some time yet. How long will it take? I'll answer that in a minute. So this is what the Voyagers have gone through. Uh, so like I said earlier, if you looked at a diagram about 15 years ago, uh, or even even 10 years ago, uh, uh, so I should say uh, Voyager 1 inter entered the interstellar medium in uh, on July 25th, 2012, uh, almost, I guess it was exactly 35 years from when it was launched, which is pretty cool. Um, 25 years and five days, um, 35 years yeah. and five days. Um, but, uh, they expected to see something called a bow shock, which was a highly, uh, complex and turbulent area. And they didn't find it at all. What they, so it has caused this reformulation, uh, of what we thought uh, the interstellar medium edge looked like. Oh, this, in fact, this, this diagram, in fact, is from uh, 2009. And you see, it still shows a bow shock there. And that bow shock is gone. And now it's considered to be a bow wave that is in a single plane uh, that neither of the Voyagers hit. So, so basically, uh, the termination shock is where sort of the solar wind stops being the primary thing that the Voyagers encounter. Then you hit a slowdown region where there's still a solar wind, but there's also, but it's starting to get turbulent and it's starting to move in different directions. And then you hit a stagnation region where the solar wind isn't really pushing on it anymore. And, the, and, but the interstellar wind isn't actually pushing on it either. It's just kind of, it's like where, you know, an estuary where two rivers run into the sea, it all gets mixed up together and it kind of is stagnant. And then once it gets past that, and so the slowdown region and the stagnation region are called the helio sheath. It's like the, the shell around the sun. And then after it gets out of that, that's called the heliopause. After that, it's an interstellar space according to our second definition. And uh, so, so that was a, it came as a surprise to people. People didn't know exactly how far out the interstellar medium was. People didn't know when Voyager was going to enter it. So uh, Voyager 1 
got out there in 2012. Voyager 2 got out there uh, much later, six years later, on November 5th, 2018. And uh, you can see this is a, unfortunately, JPL didn't make one of these for Voyager 1, uh, but uh, Voyager 2 uh, notched Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. 19, almost 19 billion miles traveled. Uh, so quite, quite a record for it to have. Now, when will those news articles saying that the Voyagers have left the solar system be true? When will the Voyagers be interstellar by our third definition? It's going to be a while, 30,000 years before they actually leave our solar system. So, so if you just hold on to those old web articles for 30,000 years, eventually they'll be true. And with great apologies to Gary Michael Ross, uh, the big question in everyone's mind is when are they going to come back? And if you understand what this is a picture of, you are a terrible geek like me. Uh, now, what other probes are going to go interstellar according to definition two? The list is pretty short. Pioneer 10 and 11 uh, were the, the vanguard of our solar system exploration. Unfortunately, they had very short-lived plutonium batteries compared to the Voyager, and they died quite some time ago. I believe it was in the uh, mid to late 2000s, both of them. And uh, so they are just dead chunks of metal now. Uh, they're not controlled. They can't send any data back. Uh, and I don't know that we can even see them. I don't know how closely they can even be tracked because they don't emit any light and don't reflect much light. So, uh, But they are on their way out. We know what track they were on, and we know that eventually they're going to leave the solar system. Uh, excuse me, leave the sun's uh, <laughs> dynamic environment and eventually, eventually leave the solar system. Uh, when is that going to happen? Pioneer 11 is going in approximately the same direction as Voyager 1 and 2. It's going out the front of the solar system in the direction the sun is moving. Uh, the, inter the, the sun's uh, dynamic environment is squashed because the sun is full flying into the interstellar medium. So it's actually much shorter uh, than it would be if it were going the opposite direction. Pioneer 10 is going the opposite direction. It's going opposite the direction the sun is moving in the galaxy. And as a result, the uh, solar uh, dynamic environment is actually twice as far as uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, we, we have cable fun going on over here. Uh, we're trying to keep my internet connection alive. Um, so, uh, so it's actually going to take until the year 2057 before Pioneer 10 leaves the solar dynamic environment. And here is their path. Uh, so this shows them through the mid 90s uh, and you can see Pioneer 10 is going backwards out of the solar system. So uh, New Horizons, uh, you may be aware, is going really, really fast. But is it going fast enough to catch up? Uh, the answer is yes, eventually, but it's going to be a long time. Uh, so New Horizons is going to leave the solar dynamic environment in the year 2043, five years after Pioneer 11 leaves. And uh, it will catch up with Pioneer 11 and surpass it, but it may take more than 5,000 years to do so. So don't wait up for it. Uh, so this is, uh, this shows the track through the, part of the Kuiper belt that New Horizons has gone through. So uh, in addition to the probes, you have to think the probes got there somehow. And what goes out in, in terms of gravity must keep going. 
So the third stages of all of those probes are actually chasing their spacecraft out of the solar system as well. What does that mean? Yes, that means what you think it means. Humankind has found a way to pollute interstellar space. So count that as another victory for civilization right there. Now, what natural interstellar objects are there by the solar dynamic environment definition? Pretty much most of the comets we ever see. Anything coming from the Oort cloud is a interstellar object by that solar dynamic definition. Uh, this photo is a photo of the of our friend Neowise uh, taken by Dale Hollenbaugh up in uh, the Chesterfield area, I believe. And uh, you'll note that it actually shows the Aurora Borealis too. So this is a little bit gratuitous, but I just couldn't not use this photo in this presentation. Now, uh, natural interstellar objects by definition three, those are objects that are coming into our solar system from outside of the Oort cloud. Uh, and as you may be aware, so far, there are only a, a couple. So we'll start from the beginning with one eye that's the first interstellar object, Oumuamua, uh, which I have subtitled the intergalactic thingamajig, because we're really not quite sure what it is. So, in fact, we're still not 100% sure what shape it is, and odds are we'll never know for sure. Uh, one of the first tongue-in-cheek hypotheses was that it was one of the monoliths from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Probably not that. Uh, a still popular model for it is that it's a cigar-shaped object spinning endlessly through space. Uh, another popular visualization of it is that it's a space pancake that it's more flat than cylinder shape and it's spinning its way through our solar system and then back out again but we don't really know so far and unless something spectacular happens which i'll get into at the end of this presentation uh, we probably will never know but we do know that it's pretty red uh, in coloration, and we know that it's spinning really fast. So how do we know those things? Well, we have light curves, and we have light curves from a lot of different telescopes, from the Very Large Telescope, from the Gemini uh, North and South Observatories, from the Keck, from the California France Hawaii Telescope, and the I'm blinking on what UKIRT stands for. Uh, UK but, oh, UK Infrared Telescope, quite possibly. So, so this is where uh, sort of the cigar-shaped model came from. But there are ways to make a pancake uh, simulate this light curve as well. But uh, it did give us a pretty good idea of the coloration of it, at least. So, how does the object stack up? from uh, against the stuff that we're familiar with. Well, it's about as tall as the Empire State Building, significantly taller than the Eiffel Tower, uh, but, but pretty human scale. Like, we see stuff that big all the time. So if we were to see it in the sky, as long as we didn't see it coming towards us, uh, it would be pretty cool to see. Uh, so what is it, though? shape aside well at first people thought well it's an interstellar comet and then they didn't see any gas or coma around it and then they said well it's an interstellar asteroid but then it seemed like it was moving in ways that suggested that it was throwing off some kind of material so they thought well maybe it's an interstellar comet after all but then some people said that uh one way to explain it is that uh, when a planet that is super close into its host star, possibly a red dwarf, is heating and cooling constantly, chunks of the planet are going to flake off and go flying in every which way. Uh, 
now I have an artist's rendition of what that could look like, uh, but I again have to ask for Gary Ross's forgiveness there. Uh, and then one super interesting hypothesis is that it's a primordial leftover from the from a hydrogen cloud that formed outside the gravitational influence of a star. So basically, the hydrogen actually condensed down into essentially a hydrogen iceberg. And, uh, and so the hydrogen sublimation uh, can provide some of the cometary behavior without looking anything else like a comet. So we'll talk about that in a second. One thing we're pretty sure it's not is a space station, which is kind of a bummer because the Arthur C. Clarke uh, novel Rendezvous with Rama postulates a spacecraft, an interstellar spacecraft flying through space that sounds just the right shape and size and rotation rate. So it's a little bit of a bummer that that didn't end up uh, panning out. Uh, so who found it? Dr. Rob Warrick? Uh, a near-Earth object postdoc fellow at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, he actually got his bachelor degree and PhD from the University of Western Ontario. Uh, I would argue in the greater Detroit area in London, Ontario. London is like halfway between Detroit and Toronto, so I, I claim it for us. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And he uh, discovered it using the pan stars one telescope on top of Mauna Kea. And uh, so that is uh, sort of how, how we found it in the first place. Um, now the name sounds pretty unfamiliar. I saw that Chantel uh, posted in the chat. I can't, I only see them momentarily before they disappear. So, but uh it's named Oumuamua because that's a Hawaiian word for scout. Uh, the U syllable means to reach out for, and the mua is first, and repeating it uh, sort of adds emphasis. So, so like the really, really first. Uh, so it, it kind of means like first distant messenger, and, and so a, a way to translate that is scout. And it was chosen by the Pan Stars team with guidance from Kaiu Kimura and Larry Kimura of the University of Hawaii at Hilo. So it's a super cool name. But you probably spent some time following the news about it when it was called C2017U1. That stands for uh, the Unidentified Comet of 2017. And then it turned into the A twenty seventeen U one or the asteroid, the unidentified asteroid of twenty seventeen. Then it got the one interstellar designation once we were convinced that it was an interstellar object, and it just kind of went everywhere. But now it's pretty universally called one I Umuamua. So you won't get in trouble if you use that formulation. So where did it come from and where is it going? We don't really know where it really originated from or where it's really going to, but uh, we do have some pretty good models uh, for which area of the sky it came from to us and which area of the sky it's going out to. So you can see uh, it came from sort of the area uh, between Hercules and, and Lyra. Uh, it spiraled in. You can see those super cool tight spirals. Uh, and then swept through the inner solar system uh, quite close to the sun. You'll, you'll see some animations in a minute that show how that worked. And uh, then it shot out, and it is currently in the middle of the great square of Pegasus, and it's just going to keep going on in that direction forever. But in terms of where it originated and where it will end up in physical space, 
Uh, we don't have great models for that yet. Um, now, it's interesting to note that Oumuamua has a pretty standard velocity for brown dwarfs and other stuff near the sun. So, so the kind of, not to, not to be, uh, not to say anything bad about all of the, uh, the stuff floating around in our solar system, but it's sort of the flotsam and jetsam of our galaxy. Uh, and it's just sort of riding the wave with everything else. And uh, so there's a pretty, it, it feels pretty hopeful that there will be more objects like this in the future, even if we don't get to catch up with it, which we probably won't. So it may have just been drifting for billions of years before it decided to join us for a brief, bright, warm sojourn. Uh, so when it came in, it came in from basically straight over the solar system. It went so close to the sun that it was between the sun and Mercury. And uh, it was September 9th of 2017 that it made its perihelion. And you can tell, uh, you'll see a little bit better in a minute, but you can tell how sharp that curve was. Because normally comets, you know, normally comets that pass that close to the sun are in a little bit of trouble, especially if they're in a wacky orbit. And uh, this one was just going, if this had been going any slower, it would have been, but it was going so fast that it, you know, couldn't, couldn't be held on to for long. So we were talking about uh, what time scale things leave the solar system on. Well, Oumuamua took a long time to get here, and it's going to take a long time to leave. So it is still well within the solar dynamic environment, uh, although prob I believe it's only going to be like 20 years before it leaves that it's actually going to be in our solar system for 20,000 more years uh, before it actually passes through the Oort cloud and back into true interstellar space, according to that definition. Uh, I'm going to talk very briefly about how we know where it came from and where it's going and how we drew all of those crazy pictures of where it is going to go. But basically, there's different kinds of parabolic orbits. Uh, so if you have an eccentricity of an orbit of zero, that means it's a perfect circle around a focus point. If you are between zero and one, it's an ellipse. So you get something like the planetary orbits. If it's one exactly, uh, you get a parabolic orbit where it makes a neat uh, parabola around the sun. And if it's greater than one, it's a hyperbolic orbit, and that means that it is going to be leaving the solar system. So Oumuamua's orbital eccentricity is 1.2, the highest ever observed, including Comet Borisov. Uh, only Comet C 1980E1 was previously observed to have a hyperbolic orbit with an eccentricity of 1.057, so really close to that parabolic uh, number, and uh, and that I believe was perturbed by Neptune and flung in, uh, so that was not an interstellar object. Um, so this is these are the two uh, objects that allowed people to figure out how orbits worked. Uh, figuring out how Mars behaved was what gave Kepler the uh, key insight into how elliptical orbits worked and the fact that orbits were elliptical. And uh, Sirius is how he proved that it actually, that his ideas actually work. So Kepler's laws uh, in brief are all gravitationally bound objects move in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus. A line that connects a planet to the sun sweeps out equal area in equal time. And the square of the period of any planet is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of the orbit. That one is super important, but we're, we can't really get into it. Um, so, but essentially, like if you can observe, if you can observe, if you can take three observations of the object 
you should be able to calculate where it came from and where it's going to. And the more calculations you can add to that, the more you can follow Gauss's method and get more and more precise. And we thankfully took a lot of observations of Oumuamua. Despite the fact that it was extremely faint, uh, we took 22 observations over 41 days. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to skip that. So I, I included some of these uh, equations in here just to scare Dale Parton, uh, but uh, but it's actually above my head and I consider myself a pretty mathematically aware person. So uh, someday I'm going to someday I'm going to get my uh, my tensor analysis figured out, but it's not today. So um, the minor planet electronic circular that went out in early 2017 asked, you know, was begging observatories to look at Oumuamua, and uh, they basically said, it looks like it's about 1.2 orbital eccentricity. Uh, if we can get more observations to confirm this, then we're going to be positive that it's an interstellar comet. And that was after six days of observations. But even, even with six days of heavy observing from basically every large telescope on Earth, uh, they, they still hedge their bets a little bit. But we kept looking at it after that, and uh, it's a, a done deal a confirmed interstellar object. Now there is one thing that that hyperbolic orbit alone doesn't explain. So that shows the track of Oumuamua, but you're going to see something happen. According to just the Newtonian physics of the thing, it should have ended up 25,000 miles away from where it actually ended up which means that it's being pushed. And it's being pushed in a way that is too strong for water ice melting to explain, as with a normal comet. Uh, and so that is one of the major pieces of evidence that the uh, primordial hydrogen iceberg proponents uh, use for supporting the idea that it's one of those. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, at this point, we can't really take new data about it. Like, we got our data, and unless we do something crazy, which I'll talk about in a bit, uh, we're just going to have to wait for the next one. And speaking of the next one, uh, Comet Borisov. So, Comet Borisov, you know, what is, what is Comet Borisov? I kind of gave it away. It's an interstellar comet. Or is it really? No, it's it's an interstellar comet. Uh, it this is the initial discovery recorded uh, by Gennady Borisov in on August thirtieth, twenty nineteen, uh, the day after my birthday, and uh, and so Borisov reported it to the International Astronomical Unit's Minor Planet Center uh, that very day. Pretty much right away, everybody turned uh, their attention to it. Uh, the Hubble was looking at it soon thereafter. And uh, what's interesting about it is, sorry, I'm, my slides are a little bit out of place here. Um, so this actually shows you how fast it's moving. Uh, this is a Hubble. This is a time lapse of the Hubble's observations of it. It's moving so fast that those are all stars in the background field. They're just flying by. So they were really taxing the Hubble's uh, reaction wheels tracking this object. Um, now, Borisov is really interesting because a high carbon monoxide to water ratio, as we observed in it, suggests that it's come from a very cold place. Uh, that it formed in something like a Kuiper belt, but probably based on the materials that we saw in it, uh, 
it seems likely that it came from a Kuiper belt like uh, structure around a red dwarf rather than a yellow dwarf like our sun or something warmer than that. Uh, so the ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Ray tel Radio Telescopes in Chile, uh, actually did a lot of observations of it too, and they're the ones who really got the uh, chemical analysis uh, figured out. Uh, Borisov's unusual properties also suggest that maybe comets can be more diverse in how much carbon monoxide they can have than previous models suggest. So it actually has challenged our very solar system centric idea of comets, even though it looks exactly like the comets we're familiar with. Now, one thing to note about Comet Borisov is that if you take the coma and the tail into account, it's actually 14 times the size of the volume of Earth. So that kind of uh, puts things in perspective. Not quite as large as Comet Holmes, which was uh, the coma ended up being as large as the sun, but quite large nonetheless. So uh, you, you heard his name earlier. Uh, it's right there in the name. Uh, but who found Comet Borisov? Uh, Gennady Borisov is an engineer at the Crimean Astronomical Station of the Sternberg Astronomical Institute in Moscow State University in Crimea. Uh, he also, he, he actually works as an engineer at the professional observatory there, but he doesn't make observations for the university. Uh, he works with the Astronomicsky Nauchi Center, uh, creating experimental telescopes in collaboration with Roscosmos to put in to look at putting into space. And he pursues astronomy in his spare time at his personal observatory, Margo, uh, which you see around him in Nauchni. And uh, between 2013 and 2019, he discovered nine comets and several near-Earth objects, such as 2013 TV-135. And all of those discoveries were made with telescopes that he built himself, that he designed and built himself. Uh, so, so not only is he a you know god among uh, ATMers, uh, he is also one of the few amateurs out there uh, who are still discovering comets on their own because the professional surveys sweep up like pan stars and neowise sweep up so much uh, that it's really hard for amateur astronomers to compete. And many of the ones who are successful, at, although to an, a visual observer like me, it's lex a little bit of the soul, but a lot of the people who are su successful are beating the professionals at their own game and bringing their own astrometry uh, setups to the challenge. So here's where his observatory is. You can see it's right in the middle of the Black Sea. Like we are in Michigan, it's surrounded by water, and he can get away from the light pollution of everything around there. Uh, I feel a little bit uh, close to this because my grandfather was from Krasnodar here over to the right, and my grandmother was from Kharkiv uh, just north of there. So, And uh, family friends are from Crimea as well. Uh, Crimea is, you know, currently under occupation by the Russian government. Uh, well, so far, not much, not much happening there. But I believe Borisov was there when it was still uh, held by the Ukrainians, and I presume he's not going anywhere, no matter what happens. Um, so yeah. Um, so where did Comet Borisov come from, and where is it going? So you can see Oumuamua made this super sharp uh, pivot around the sun. Comet Borisov was nowhere near as close to the sun as Oumuamua was. It was just flying in from above, outside the orbit of Mars, so it was perturbed far less than Oumuamua was. So, uh, so it's doing about a hundred thousand miles per hour right now. Uh, so we're 
you're going to have a hard time catching up with it. Because Oumuamua slingshotted around the sun, uh, it actually lost a little speed and made it a little bit easier to catch up with. Uh, so this gives you some idea. This is both comet, both uh, interstellar objects together. Gives you some idea of just how violent Oumuamua got turned around and how little uh, Comet Borisov actually got thrown off course by its pass through the solar system. And this is sort of the top-down view of Borisov. So it got, it got flung at a pretty good angle, but not nearly so violent. So a group of astronomers in Poland have actually proposed Kruger 60, or D-O-C-F-E, in the constellation Cepheus, as the origin of Comet Borisov. It is a double star, and uh, I believe I believe it's like a uh, double dwarf star or something. But uh, they published a paper uh, last year suggesting this, uh, and they're still still trying to get more evidence for it. But uh, they reached a conclusion that a million years ago, uh, Comet Qi Borisov passed Kruger 60 at a distance of only 1.74 parsecs, while also having an extremely small relative velocity of 3 kilometers per second. So that is evidence that it was actually more or less in orbit there and then got perturbed out and flung out. So that is, uh, that is right now our best guess of where it came from. Again, as with Oumuamua, we're not really sure where it's going to end up after, you know, the fullness of time. So uh, beyond those uh, objects that we have already seen, uh, what's next? What should we be looking for and what should we be excited about in the world of interstellar objects? Well, uh, oh my gosh, I credited this to the wrong people. Uh, this should be credited to the European uh, Space Agency. But uh, the Comet Interceptor is a European Space Agency mission. Uh, and <laughs> they don't have much in the way of uh, mock-ups yet. Uh, it was selected by the ESA in June 2019 as their new fast class mission in the Cosmic Vision program. Uh, they're targeting launch in 2028. So as you might be able to guess, they don't have any mock-ups of what the actual craft would look like yet. But the way it's going to work is there's going to be three spacecraft, and they're going to be parked in orbit around the sun. And when they... When we see an interstellar comet coming that is close enough for them to catch up with, they're actually going to take out out of their parked orbit, chase it down, and take three-dimensional images of it and record it in as many, you know, it record uh, chemical signatures and whatever else they can get from it. So uh, we won't have the frustration of having something like the Muamua slipped through her fingers again. Uh, a, so this is the crazy uh, project that I was telling you about. Um, a group, uh, the Initiative for Interstellar Studies, or I4IS, uh, has started this program called Project Lyra, and it's not exactly a space program on its own. This is just a think tank of people, very smart people, but uh, people who are asking for more than the politicians the world are probably willing to give. But the goal of the project is to figure out a way to catch up with the interstellar objects that we already know about. And they actually have missions. Uh, they've figured out missions that would allow us to launch in 2021, 2024, or even 2028, and catch up with either Borisov or Muramua. Uh, and 
while those timelines seem awfully tight, uh, it's still, you know, a very attractive idea to be able to get information about these great comets that we, or these great interstellar objects that we've been looking for a long time and we've never seen them. It's possible that now that we know that they exist, we'll find a lot more of them, but it's also possible that like a bright comet like Neowise, uh, they just don't come along very often. So I, I kind of hope they manage to find somebody to fund this. Uh, and, you know, to the, to the point of the debate that took place earlier this month, uh, if I were going to spend a whole ton of money in space exploration, I think I would throw it at a project like this, uh, because that could teach us so much more about the greater universe than we possibly can learn just by looking at what's in our solar system. And finally, uh, Johns Hopkins University's Applied Physics Library has the extremely creatively named Interstellar Probe Program. Uh, that really is the official name of the program. At least it's not some crazy backronym like, like space scientists usually go for. Uh, but, but the Interstellar Probe Project is a slight misnomer. Uh, their goal is to reach 1,000 astronomical units, which is about 1,000 times the distance from the Earth from the Sun. Uh, much further, uh, basically the goal would be to launch in the 2030s and catch up with and surpass the Voyagers uh, in a matter of about 20 years. Uh, so the goal would be within 50, within 50 years, uh, we would get into deep into the interstellar medium and be able to keep reporting stuff back uh, in a way that the Voyager probes, which weren't designed for this kind of work, uh, have not been able to give us everything we would like to know from out there. And then there's always the possibility that uh, interstellar space can come to us. Uh, so hopefully we don't have any black holes uh, come flying into our solar system. You know, I would prefer to have nothing more exciting than in Mumua or Borisov, if, if I'm being honest. I don't want any don't want any free planets coming in or black holes or anything like that. Uh, so. So I would rather have us go out and seek interstellar space rather than have it come to visit us. That's all I have for right now. Uh, so if anyone has any questions and if somebody could uh, check out YouTube and let me know if there are any questions in the text there, I would appreciate it. Excellent presentation. Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, and there has to be some question that I can say that I don't know how to answer. You're pretty complete. It's, <laughs> you did a good job. John, an easy one. How many people are watching on YouTube? Oh, I, I actually don't know. Uh, uh, Doug, are you on the YouTube? Yeah, he says 15. Thank you. Okay. All right. So this new system is going to actually pick them up as they come in. Is that what you're saying? These these satellites? Well, so, so the, I mean, the, uh, the European Space Agency has funded the Comet Interceptor Program. So by, by 2030, uh, we should have a way to catch up with a comet like the moon or Borisov if it came into the inner solar system. Assuming all goes well, you know, obviously the James Webb Space Telescope, I believe, was supposed to launch in 2016 originally, if I recall correctly. So, you know, if there's one thing I've learned in engineering, it's that uh, the date is never final until it's done. All right. What was the shape? What was the shape of Boris? Did they say was it anything similar to you? Know, uh, 
Uma Omar. Again? Be able to tell the shape of the, of the, of uh, Coruscant. I mean, I mean, other than other than you know uh, a greater concentration of carbon monoxide than we're familiar with with comets from our solar system. There was nothing special about Borisov's structure or behavior. It was it was a comet. Like it was it was a very familiar comet in every way except for the carbon monoxide concentration. So super exciting, but also very familiar, uh, which you know not quite as Umumu is such a weird object uh, that uh, you know we were a little bit spoiled. If Borisov had been the first interstellar object, people would have probably been a lot more excited about it than they were. Not that it, people are still pretty excited about it. But. Jonathan, it looks like you might have a comet coming in right behind you. Oh dear! It's a bright light. <laughs> it is. I have. Uh, I have. I have a light behind me, so I would be afraid uh, it was a woodpecker. Have, have we ever seen any objects like that at all uh, that are shaped as weirdly as Umau Mau was? No, no. I mean, it, and it's definitely the you know strangest, strangest thing that we've ever observed close up, and that's why. You know, that's why I you know if I if I we're holding the purse strings. Right so I would be. Uh, There's a window with daylight behind. <laughs> if I were holding the purse strings, I would be funding something like uh, Project Vega to, to try, or Project Lightning, I should say, to uh, try to catch up with Umuamua because it is so strange. It's possible we'll see something more like that in the future, but uh, I, you know, it's kills me to pass up the opportunity to study the one that we have seen. What's the best way to get out of here? Just get the little X's all over the place or what? <laughs> yeah, it, so, uh, so Ken, it's the, uh, if you, if you uh, mouse over the thing, it's the big X on the right uh, that says leave meeting. It's like a big red circle with an X in the middle of it. Leave meeting, so let me see. All righty. Well, if there are no more questions, I heartily encourage you. It sounds like uh, sounds like the uh, clouds have blown away over Metro Detroit. So uh, try to try to find some clear sky to the northwest and uh, get out there and observe. Me. And I'm do the very same thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. All righty. Thanks very much for joining us, and see you soon. See you. Bye. Good, good night, all. I'm going to shut down the feed. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.